I'm Pastor Brian, one of the teaching pastors here. Some of you don't recognize me because I, you notice there's something different about me. I wear pink now. No, just kidding. It's the, uh, it's the, it's the glasses. I, if I finally got there. I got too old. And so now I have to wear glasses. And so I'm getting used to these just as you are. So let's just get over it, all right? Could we just all get over it? I walked in this morning, and Pastor Tom said, you look smarter. And then I walked up to the kids' church table, and Marina said the exact same thing, that I look smarter. And I just told them both, thank you for not calling me dumb all these years. And uh, one, one, per, one woman, bless her heart, she said, um, I look taller, which is great. I'll take that. Uh, so I look smarter and taller now. But all I know is I can see a little bit better now when I read. And I don't know if I'm going to, this, it's very hard for me. It's very distracting. And I'm sure it is for you as well. But we're going to get through this together. Amen? Let's get, yeah, let's get through this together. Hey, I want to say, before we get into our, we're starting a new series today on the parables of Jesus. But before we get to that, I want to just make a comment about these uh, Easter cards. We did this last year, and it was so, it was such a meaningful thing to do. Pastor Dave suggested this. He's, you know, he said years ago, he started doing this at one of his churches, is he encouraged everyone, when Easter was coming, he encouraged everybody to start praying about who you would invite to Easter and to write their names down on a card. He said that he, he's done that every Easter. And so we started this last year, maybe the year before. Many of you did this last year, and we're encouraging you to do it again this year. So what you do is you take one of these sheets. They're out in the lobby. They're over by the giving boxes today. Grab one of these little cards. It's a little Easter card. And at the top, it says, friends that I'm praying for and inviting. And there's just three names. And we just really encourage you to write down three names. Everyone can do this. Write down three names and just, these are the people you're praying for and you're inviting. Now, I know some of you are like, man, that just sounds really weird. That sounds like multi-level marketing almost or something like that. But let me just remind you, you're not making anything off of this. You're, you're doing this for the good of other people. You're doing this because you love other people. You're doing this, I mean, think about it. For you, if you knew that somebody had been praying for you, for years before you ever came to Alpine, would that offend you if you found out? I don't think it, it shouldn't offend you. You should feel touched that somebody, that you made somebody's top three. Like that's, I think that's awesome. I'd be offended if I wasn't on your, on your list, you know? So we encourage you to write down three names, okay? Those are people you're praying for and inviting. And then just pray for them and invite them to Easter, to our Easter service. Easter is one of those times, just like Christmas Eve, it's one of those times that you can actually invite someone to church, and it's not that weird. It's not that awkward. It's not that weird. Just invite them. And, hey, come to our Easter service. It's a lot of fun to encourage, encourage you. I, I meet people all the time, when I, and I ask them, how long have you been going to Alpine? Just last week, I met someone at Layton that said this. She said, I've been going to Alpine for five years. I said, oh, that's great. She said, I came on Easter. I hear that all the time. All the time that people come on Easter, and what happens is they get hooked. They come on Easter, they see people, you know, enjoying church and singing together and a message that's understandable and coffee, and it's just, for so many people, it just blows their mind. They didn't know church could be like this. And they come back, and they come back. Maybe many of you in here, you're the first time you came was on Easter. And so, again, if, you're, if you call Alpine your home church, you can impact somebody by doing that. And it's, we're a month away. So that's why we're saying it now. Many of you took our challenge last month to read, read the Bible for 40 days. I hope you'll continue to read now. And so our challenge this month is to grab one of these Easter cards and then write down friends you're praying for and inviting. And then after Easter, you can actually write down on there, the next, the next line is the people who actually came. And you can write down their names if they came. And what we encourage you to do with this is just stick it in your Bible and keep it in there forever. Because it'll remind you of what, of what you've done. In fact, Pastor Dave, literally when he told us about this idea, this was his idea. Great idea. He's, he actually pulled, he pulled the sheet out of his Bible in our teaching meeting and showed it to us. It was so cool. And he said, these, and it was, I mean, he's got, he's got one for every year. He's, he pulled one of them out and he said, this was, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. And he said, he looked at their names and he, he said, oh, these people are all still pursuing God. I just, I think that was so cool. So I encourage you to do this. Take that challenge to grab this Easter card. I call it a card. It's just a sheet of paper. But, um, but grab one of those and do that this, with, 
this week with us, this month, and invite someone to join us for Easter, okay? Easter's a lot of fun. We'll have a packed house on Easter. We always do. And uh, we'll, we hope to see you there on our Easter weekend. We're, but today we're starting a series called Perplex, Perplexing Parables. Say that a hundred times fast. And we're going to do this series all the way up until Easter, okay? So we're going to take a look at four parables of Jesus. And we, per, we in particular chose four very perplexing parables. Parables. Perplexing means confusing, hard to understand. The parables of Jesus were stories that Jesus told to try to get a point across. That's what his parables were. He would tell stories to get a point across. It's kind of like the modern day parable of the cookie. Some of you have heard this parable before. It's not a parable of Jesus. It's a modern day parable. But this woman went to the airport. She's waiting for her flight. She had some extra time. So she bought a little bag of cookies. She sits down and she is, pulls out a book and starts reading the book and reaches into the bag and grabs a cookie out and starts eating it. And the guy next to her reaches into the bag and grabs a cookie out and starts eating it. And she look, kind of looked at him and he kind of looked at her and she thought, well, that is rude. She took a deep breath, kept, kept reading her book. Finished her cookie, reached in, grabbed another cookie out, started eating it. He looked at her, reached in, grabbed another cookie out, and started eating it. He's reading his book. She's reading her book. Now she's getting mad. So she finishes the cookie. She looks in there. He looks in there. There's one cookie left. He grabs a cookie, breaks it in half, puts the half in there, and starts eating his half. And she was just livid at this point. She thought, I can't even believe the nerve of this guy. And he's just calm over there. He doesn't look flustered at all. It doesn't even, oh, it almost doesn't look like he's trying to be mean. And that makes her matter. Right? It's biblical. If you want to really get un, under someone's skin, Jesus said, be nice to your enemies, right? That's a trick. That's a little tip for you. Some of you need to write that down real quick. So he eats his half, and she eats her half, and she gets up, and she gets on the plane, and she is mad. She sits down on the plane. She reaches into her purse and finds her bag of cookies. That's a parable. And that's how parables are supposed to work. It turns out it was his bag of cookies, not hers. And it makes you look at the story differently, doesn't it? It makes you go back and rewind and think about this guy. Well, this was the nice guy. She was the jerk. What a gracious guy that he would split that last cookie in half for this rude, obnoxious woman. And that's the parable of the cookies. And it's meant, this is how Jesus told parables. He would tell a parable to try to get a point across he, you're listening to the story, and you're going along with the story, and then all of a sudden it's kind of like a joke. There's a punchline in the parable that makes you go, oh, I never thought about it like that. And Jesus told parables all the time because he wanted to reach regular people. He told parables about regular stuff that everyday people could relate to because Jesus didn't come for the Pharisees and the rich people and the smart people, he came for everybody. He came for every, and he wanted, to, he wanted to explain the kingdom of God in a way that everyone could understand. And so he chose to speak in parables. He would tell stories to get people to open their eyes to certain truths and, and certain principles. And so every one of these parables in this series, we're going to be unpacking some of these principles that Jesus was trying to get at when it comes to following God. And the first one comes from Matthew, or Mark chapter 4. So let's take a look at the parable of the growing seeds. It says this in Mark chapter 4, verse 26. Jesus said this, The kingdom of God is like a farmer who scatters seed on the ground. Okay, so this is how many of his parables start, start out. He's trying to describe what the kingdom of God is like because the people didn't really understand what Jesus was coming to inaugurate. The people didn't, couldn't put together 
that Jesus is, is trying to usher in this new kingdom, this new way of living, this new way of relating to God. Because they had preconceived notions about what religion and faith was about. Maybe some of you are here today and you say, that's me. I, have pre- I come to the table with preconceived notions. I come to the table with kind of an expectation for how things should work. An expectation for how God should work. An expectation for how God should relate to me. Many of you are here today saying, yeah, I've been burned by God because I have an expectation. Or I've been disappointed by God because I have an expectation. Well, this parable is for you. Because Jesus is going to tell this story to help you to understand how God actually works. And so he says, it's, the kingdom of God is like this farmer who scatters seed on the ground and day and night while he's asleep or awake. The seed sprouts and grows. But he doesn't understand how it happens. I could just see Jesus as he's trying to, he's got this, he's got this truth in mind that he wants to explain to people. And he's like, how can I get them to understand this? How can I, how can I open their eyes to this, to this truth? And we're going to get to the truths here in a minute. He's, how can I get them to understand it? He thought, it's kind of like a farmer. And so he told the story. The earth produces the crops on its own. First the leaf blade pushes through, and then the heads of wheat are formed, and finally the grain ripens. But he goes on and he says, as soon as the grain is ready, the farmer comes out and harvests it with the sickle. For the harvest time had come, but what was the farmer doing the whole time? He's just going to bed, getting up, going to bed, getting up. He's not out there actively making it work. He's not out there doing, he planted the thing and then it just happened. At some point the leaf just pokes through. Like what's up with that? And Jesus is trying to get us to understand something with this. But then he told another parable because he wanted to, he wanted to get it even clearer in people's minds. So he said, how can I describe the kingdom of God? I wonder if almost like he told the first parable and the, guy, the people were just sitting there going, what are you talking about? How is that the kingdom of God? How is that like the kingdom of God? And he sees the look on their face. He sees that they don't understand it. Have you ever tried to explain something to somebody? And you could just tell by, their, by the look on their face or by their response or by the drool coming out of their side of their mouth. Like, this guy doesn't get it. And so I think maybe that's what's happening. He's, he tells this parable and he's just like, No. So he says, how can I describe the kingdom of God? What story should I use to illustrate it? And so he says, it's like a mustard seed. How about this, everybody? It's like a mustard seed planted in the ground, and many of us know this one. He says, it's the smallest of all seeds, but it becomes the largest of all garden plants. It grows long branches, and birds can make nests in its shade. And so with these two parables of the growing seeds, Jesus is trying to explain how the kingdom of God works. Let's pray one more time before we get into that explanation. God, I pray that you would help us to understand your word. You spoke these words 2,000 years ago, and there were principles behind this parable, these two parables, that you wanted your hearers to understand. And God, if you wanted them to understand them 2,000 years ago, you still want us to understand them today. So give us ears to hear, in Jesus' name, amen. Jesus is talking about expectations. In these parables, Jesus is trying to help us understand that this is how the kingdom of God works. God can do more than you expect. Not as much as you expect, not less than you expect. God can do more than you expect. But the way he does it might surprise you. The way it works might not line up with your expectations for how God should work in your life. And that's what these parables are about. So before we get into a few practical lessons from this parable, from these parables, I want you to just think about your expectations when it comes to God. What do you expect God to do? Another word for expectation is hope. What are you hoping God would do? Some of you, maybe you're hoping God would get through to your spouse. Some of you, maybe you're hoping God would get through to your teenagers. Some of you, maybe are hoping for a child. Some of you, maybe are hoping for a husband or wife. 
I would encourage you to hope for that first before the child. Some of you young people are hoping for more friends or for better friends. Some of you young adults are hoping for that person that you can spend the rest of your life with. What are you expecting when you come to God? A real easy way to answer this question is what have you been praying for? What have you been going to God with and praying for? Some of you have been praying for a certain thing for 20 years. Some of you aren't even that old. Some of you have been praying for something for a couple of weeks. What are you praying for? What are you hoping for? What are you looking to God for? What are you coming to God asking for? Because that will show you what your expectations are for God. And it's no different today than it was 2,000 years ago. It's, it's still just people trying to relate to God and trying to make it through life or make it through whatever, make it through a season of life. We all have expectations when it comes to God. And that's why these parables are so valuable because Jesus is trying to help us understand, like, this is how God's kingdom works. I want you to know this is how God's kingdom works works. And there are three principles that we can pull out of these parables that I want you to wrestle with and hopefully talk about in small groups this week or with your families. The first one is this. We have to be patient with God's timing. You have to be. God doesn't work in the timing that you expect all the time. Very seldom does he work exactly when you want him to work. And that's why we have to be patient. I mean, look at that again, that, that back to Mark chapter 4. It says, night and day, while the farmers asleep or awake, it doesn't matter, asleep or awake, the seed sprouts and grows, and he doesn't understand how it happens. This last year has been the year, this is the year that we will look back on our family pictures and say this is the year that A.J. grew, our son. He's 15 now. And those of you who have known AJ over the years, you see him over here at this campus, you see him like maybe once every month or so. And so some, for you, you notice the difference because every time you see him, you're, he's just a little bit taller. Like a, for some of you, a lot. If you haven't seen him in a few months, he's my height now. At the beginning of the summer, he was shorter than Kenzie. Now, Kenzie's not short. Okay, quit calling my daughter short. But he was the shortest one in the family at the beginning of the summer. We look back on our family pictures, and, and we see us standing there in Washington, D.C., and A.J.'s shorter than Kenzie. We, I mean, we literally just looked at these pictures the other day. We're like, oh, my goodness. How did this happen? See, we don't notice it because we see him every morning and every day. We don't always want to, but we see him every, every day. There he is. He shows up. He's asking for food again. You know? But if we zoom out a little bit, if we take a look at some pictures, we can see, we can see what the growth process is like in him. Now, for him, it's hard because he wants to grow, just like every boy. He wants to be tall, and so he's, he's eating and, and drinking a lot of milk, and he's doing every, he's reading, he's Googling it and figuring out everything he could ever possibly do. To be tall, he's trying to maximize it. He told us the other day that he actually, at night when he goes to bed, he hooks his feet on the end of his bed, and he pulls himself up when he sleeps. I remember Bobby Brady used to do that. Anyone remember that in the Brady Bunch? He used to hang from the monkey bars. All these little tricks, right? Because, we, because of something that we so desperately want. He wants to be tall. But if he would just look back and he would see, wow, I'm actually getting tall. And in, for many of us in our lives, it's the same. If we would just kind of look back, that's why I always encourage people to journal. If you would journal, you might look back and say, wow, look at what God has done in my life. I might not notice it sort of day to day like the farmer. He goes to, he goes to bed, he wakes up, he looks out in the field, no grain. He goes to bed, he wakes up, he looks out in the field, no grain. But then one day, the leaf sprouts through. Oh, that's interesting. But it's just tiny. It's just tiny. It's not like a time lapse. He didn't have a camera on it and you could see it. But, but if he did and you could speed it up, you see how God works, how he consistently works to make that grow. And Jesus is saying, this is how the kingdom of God works. You do your thing. You do your thing. You do the right things and be patient. 
You have to wait on God's timing. You can't force it. You can't make it happen. Man, you want to make it happen. You want to make that prayer request come true. You want to make your spouse open his or her eyes. You want to make your teenager. You can't make them. You have to be patient. You have to wait on God's timing. That's what Jesus is saying. The second thing relates to that, and it's that we have to trust God's methods. We want to use our own methods, but God has his methods, and his ways are better than our ways. His ways are above our ways, and sometimes we try to force our method. Let's go back to Mark 4 once again. He's talking about the mustard seed. He says, it's the smallest of all seeds, but it becomes the largest of all garden plants. Why did God do it like that? Like, why, if I was God, I'd be like, okay, the bigger the seed, the bigger the plant. Just so, just keep it easy for everybody. This is just how it works. And it just does not work like that at all. Because God's not me. And I'm not God. And that's a good thing. And maybe in your situation and the thing that you're praying for, the thing that you're hoping for, that you're expecting God for, maybe you, you would just, I've done this before, maybe you've just said, God, I want this to happen like this. This is how I would do it. Here's what I would do, God, if I were in your shoes. I don't understand why you won't do it, but here's what I, I've already got this all figured out, God. I know exactly what you have to do to get through to my teenager. I know exactly what you need to do for the job that I want or for the home that I want or the neighborhood that I want, whatever that thing is that you're praying about. Sometimes we try to put ourselves in the place of God, but I think this message, the message in this parable is that we have to trust God's methods. He knows what he's doing. And sometimes that's the hardest thing, is to trust his methods. Not just his timing, but his methods. Abraham had to learn this lesson in the Old Testament. God came to Abraham and gave him a promise. He says, you're going to be a, the father of a great nation. Many nations are going to come from you. Many people, my whole, all of my people, the Israelite people are going to come from you. And Abraham said, that's awesome. And he was an old man when God made that promise to him. And he didn't have any kids. So talk about God's timing. A, he was an old man already, and God gives him this promise. And then Abraham said, but I don't have any kids. And then he waited, and he still didn't have kids. And Sarah still couldn't get pregnant. And he waited. And he waited. And he waited. And he waited. And you know what he concluded? God's methods aren't working. And so he took it into his own hands. And he and Sarah said, why don't, we, why don't you try to make God's promise come true through my maidservant? And so Sarah gave Hagar, beautiful name, Sarah gave Hagar, her maidservant, to Abraham. And Abraham had a child through Hagar. And Abraham sat back and said, thank you, God, for fulfilling your promise. I just had to take it into my own hands because your methods weren't working. And for something like 13 years, Abraham would look at Ishmael, the child of Hagar, and say, we made it happen. We made it happen. Until one day God came to Abraham and said, okay, now I'm going to fulfill my promise to you. And Abraham said, uh, have you met Ishmael? This is my son. This is, this is the promise you made. Like, we're moving forward here, God. I got this thing figured out. And God said, no, no, that was your method. I'm still going to have, have you have a child through Sarah. And sure enough, Sarah got pregnant. And she was 90 years old. And it was so ridiculous that they named him Isaac, which means he laughs. Because she laughed at the plan. Sarah laughed at his methods, at God's methods, because she thought it was so ridiculous. And then she, there she is having a child the child of the promise. And Abraham and Sarah learned that they had to trust God's methods. They tried to take it into their own hands, but at the end of the day, they had to trust God's methods. And some of you maybe need to learn that same lesson. God's methods, at the end, God's methods are the ones that will succeed. And it says this in Philippians 1.16. This is Paul speaking to the church in Philippi. He said, I'm certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. And I love this because I'm, I'm sure that he's 
speaking to parents and grandparents who are looking at their kids, or he's speaking to spouses who are looking at their their uh, new believer husband or wife. And I, I could just see this encouragement coming from Paul's pen. He's saying, God's going to finish the work. I know it's, it's early still, but God's going to do this thing. God can make this thing happen. God will complete the work in you. And so I want to encourage you, especially if you're praying for somebody who's far from God, to keep praying for that person. Keep doing your part and trust that God's going to do his part. And that leads to the last point that I think we can, we can pull from this whole message, these parables, and that is that we should be confident that God can work through each one of us. I love that he uses the parable of the tiny mustard seed, and this is just how Jesus spoke a lot. It's a little bit, I take it as a little bit of a dig. He's like, this God is, he's just in the business of using the unexpected people. Paul said it like this in 1 Corinthians. He said, God chooses the weak things of the world to shame the strong, and he chooses the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And then Jesus came to the earth, and instead of recruiting Pharisees or politicians, he recruits a bunch of fishermen and tax collectors, the lowest of all people in society. And he says, no, no, you're going to change the world. I'm going to change the world through you tiny mustard seed, and this huge movement is going to grow out of insignificant people. And I think ultimately Jesus is trying to get this message across that the, that the, the kingdom of God just is designed to work like this. I mean, read through the Bible, and it's just how God works over and over. When Abraham's body was as good as dead, God used him and gave him a child. And this is just how God works, and this should be an encouragement to all of us. In fact, we, I said in the first service that God, God uses, he came to fishermen. He didn't come to brain surgeons and rocket scientists. And a rocket scientist came up to me after the service to talk to me. And I said, God can still use you anyway. And you need to be confident that God can. Look at what he said through his prophet Zechariah. He said, do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. I love that. Small beginnings. Tiny little seeds. Small beginnings. God, the way God's kingdom works, it's just like these seeds, is if we would just be faithful and do what he has called us to do. We just keep taking those steps. The farmer planted that seed and watered that seed. He just faithfully took those steps and he left the rest up to, up to God. And if we would do that, then we would see these small beginnings turn into something incredible. And I want to just come back to this, a practical takeaway. This is a small beginning. Some of you, when I, when I talked about this Easter card, some of you said, no, I, I'm not going to do that. That's awkward. Like, I'm not the person to do that. They won't listen to me. That's not, that's, that's the enemy speaking. The kingdom of God works like this. This is how the kingdom of God works. God takes normal people, regular people like you and me, and we just do simple things. And God does this incredible work as a result of it. You need to believe that that can happen in your world, in your neighborhood, in your home, for the people that God has placed around you. And I encourage you to take these small beginnings, plant that little mustard seed of faith and see what God is going to do. God can do way more than you expect. Let's pray together. God, I pray that you would help us, every one of us, to trust this message, this, these parables that Jesus used to try to get us to understand how the kingdom of God really works. God, that it's not some accident that we're here today. There might be people sitting here today that feel so insignificant they, they feel so small in the grand scope of the universe, but they're not. Because your kingdom works like this. You use mustard seeds. You do this incredible work in us and also through us. And I pray that we would receive that. God, that we would embrace that and that we would step out in that even this week. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.